from all across the country. We've got people tuned in um, from, I think, maybe all three different time zones in the continental US or four. So um, thank you to the people on the West Coast for waking up early. Um, and we're so excited to, to talk with you all today. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jenna, and I'll be moderating the STEM education panel. Um, Unfortunately, one of our panelists is unable to join us today, but we're excited to welcome Melissa, Stephanie, and Natasha. I want to start with having you guys introduce yourselves to so say a little uh, bit about what you do, what your affiliation is, um, and your name, obviously. Uh, so we'll start with Melissa. All right, so my name is Melissa Eblen Zayas, and I am a uh, physicist at Carleton College. Um, but uh, and, and on the physics side of things, I do research in materials that have unusual electronic and magnetic properties. Um, but the other thing, uh, the other role that I get to play is I'm also director of the Teaching and Learning Center at Carleton College. So in addition to teaching physics classes myself, I also help all the new faculty who come to Carleton College sort of get their feet underneath themselves and figure out how to be teachers at, at Carleton. And then I support our faculty in uh, sort of learning new approaches, trying new things in their classrooms. And, and so I wear the hat of both a physicist and someone who supports uh, teachers in learning how to teach better. So, and I just, I'm in Minnesota, just so people know. Awesome, that's cool. Stephanie, do you want to take over now? Yeah, hi, my name is Stephanie. I'm a software engineer working at Google and my focus is in data analytics and machine learning. So that means that I get to spend my days writing code um, that focuses on those areas. And I also get to focus on community outreach. So I get to teach other developers how to use data analytics and machine learning tools. Cool, and Natasha. Hi everyone, my name is Natasha Holmes. I'm an assistant professor here at Cornell University, um, also in the physics department. And uh, my research area is actually in physics education research. So I study um, how people learn physics in our, in our classrooms. Well, great. I just wanna thank you guys again for joining this panel and remind the audience to use the Q&A feature to submit any questions. And while we wait for some questions, I will get the ball rolling. Uh, so one of the submitted questions in advance was, what changes to STEM education can or should be made in this internet age? And anyone can just jump in. Uh, I can take a stab. <laughs> um, uh, so it, it's been, uh, you know, thinking in the internet age broadly and then in our current situation more specifically, I think um, there's been a lot that we've been thinking about in terms of what STEM education looks like. So, you know, on the one hand, I think what's become really clear is that um, the sort of idea of using classes to just deliver information and tell people a bunch of facts, those facts are all over the internet. And so our classrooms really need to be um, we should take advantage of the fact that that information is available and how do we do um, other things, you know, what else do we do at the time when we're all together um, in a room if we're in person. On top of that then, um, what do we do if we're not in person and how do we account for that? So my research area has um, focused a lot on lab courses. So, you know, how do we teach students what it means to do experiments in science and in physics? Um, and that's presented a lot of challenges for us now. If we don't have, if we can't send students the specialized equipment to their homes, you know, how do we get creative and, and work at home? And I think things like cell phone technology has been um, really useful for us. We've been using a lot of apps for students to do experiments at home, but it certainly raised a lot of questions, I think, for um, how do we make use of that time and still get everyone engaged and engaging with what it means to do, to do science. I think another thing uh, building on what Natasha said is a lot of science is actually about collaboration and it's not just sort of taking in facts and sort of learning things, but it's sort of interacting with other people and talking through ideas and, and sharing um, sharing ideas and building upon each other's ideas. And, and so I think that um, is another element that becomes sort of more challenging when people aren't all in the same space and being able to sort of, you know, work through questions and explain 
explain things to each other because a lot of times the way we learn is actually not just by finding facts but sort of trying to make sense of the facts by talking through ideas with other people and so um and so I think that's important in, in how we arrange our classrooms. And I think that becomes a lot more challenging when we aren't actually physically in the same place to be able to sort of have small group discussions and work through ideas and work through problems with, with other people. Um, and so I, I do think the model of, you know, science classrooms are where you deliver ideas or deliver facts has really changed. And, and it really is a lot more about people talking through ideas, testing out ideas, um, engaging with each other. Um, and, and so the good thing with something like the internet is you can engage with people who you wouldn't normally see, right? And, and, and so that allows you to expand your networks, but, but the challenge is the sort of the nature of that interaction oftentimes doesn't feel as natural and it's, it's harder in some ways. Stephanie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, I, Basically, just add on to this idea you can access people that you normally wouldn't um, be able to in person. I think that the internet is a really useful tool within STEM education right now because it elevates voices that you wouldn't traditionally hear when you're learning about different topics. And it allows people to um, communicate their research um, more broadly. I think a lot about citizen scientists. I think a lot about you who are doing research that isn't going to be published in an academic journal, but can be shared online and um, people can get feedback um, on their work more easily. So I think the internet is just a really valuable. Uh oh, looks like we lost Stephanie, but um, so we're getting some questions from the audience. So, um, How do you keep people you teach engaged in what you teach? I think that's a really great question from the audience. I mean, I think one of the things that's really important for me when I'm working with anyone um, is to uh, start with curiosity. I think everyone is naturally curious. And so if you can find out what are things in their everyday life that people are curious about or things that they've read about or have some experience with that they're curious about, starting with the innate curiosity that everyone starts out with sort of from their childhood, right? And, and being able to find ways to capitalize on that and then build from sort of the the curiosity and things we might see or things we might have read about to things that are, I mean, one of the things about physics is that then you can move into these really abstract realms where you don't have any sort of uh, any experience that you can draw on. Um, but, but it can be sort of not, you know, really blow your mind in terms of something very strange like quantum mechanics or something. And, and so the, the challenge or how I try to engage my classes when I'm working is to, to start with questions in terms of getting people interested in terms of things that they might be, have been curious about sort of from their daily context or their daily lives and then take that curiosity and and build into sort of larger models bigger questions that that student that students might not have any sort of reference point for so so that's um, but i i always begin with the questions that people have as opposed to trying to say i'm going to you know, I'm going to lead the charge in, in this particular way. Um, well, I'm really interested in engaging um, gender diverse and racially diverse um, folks through my teaching. So one of the things that I've seen is a lot of research, research shows that those populations are very interested in helping others. That's one of the reasons why they often move into social sciences. So whenever I'm trying to teach a new subject um, or a topic, I try to engage folks with the aspects of that topic that allow you to help others. You might not be interested in data analytics just because of data, but maybe you're interested in the ways that these tools can be used to um, help solve a humanitarian crisis through gathering data. Um, or maybe you're not particularly interested in artificial intelligence, but you're interested in finding a way to help track our current pandemic. So I think that um, one of the most important ways that I approach things, like I said, is through engaging folks with the ways that we can help others and not just isolating the topic for the topic's sake. 
Yeah, and I, I think related to that, another fun thing, so in our lab courses in particular, is really giving students ownership and letting them sort of take control of, of what we're doing. And I think that builds on both of these ideas. Um, and so rather than, you know, me laying out the experiment that we're going to do to discover some known phenomenon that someone discovered decades ago, you know, let's let the students design the experiments themselves and ask the questions that they're interested in and, and get in there and see what it really is like to just um, try to satisfy that curiosity with, with their own experiments in, in the labs. And then a follow up to that. Is there a significant difference in the way you teach young kids versus college students and what are they? I think my answer is no. <laughs> I think I do a lot of stuff that's actually quite similar with, with young kids and, and college students. And um, right now I'm actually teaching a physics course for non-science majors. So this is sort of maybe one of the only science courses that these students will take while they're at university. Um, and so we've been, I've actually been pulling a lot from activities that I would do with middle school and high school students as trying to just sort of satisfy that curiosity and show them some, some experiments and activities that are exciting and fun and kind of out there. So um, I think the similarities between college students and young students are actually closer than, um, than we might think sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my experience, I, most of my experience teaching elementary schools is working with uh, my daughter's elementary school and, and doing, you know, demonstrations or science days for, for that school. Um, but, but I think in many ways, the principles are the same, right? Once again, capitalizing on people's curiosity and, and sort of engaging folks in testing out ideas and, and working hands on with things. I think the only difference that I see is um, by the time you get to college students, the complexity of the information that we use to uh, and and the complexity of the tools that we use is is much higher but but otherwise I think it's quite similar um, well I taught middle schoolers for a while and now I work on teaching other professional engineers and there is basically no difference to my approach. Everything with middle schoolers, I try, um, I try to make hands on as much as possible. And that's exactly what I do with engineers. There are a lot of computer science books and programming books that are like enormous and you can read through all the concepts and try to memorize everything. But I like to just write um, tutorials where you are interacting with the code immediately. You can copy and paste and play around. So my approach is definitely grounded in the approach I had with middle schoolers. Awesome. And then Marga would like to know, how did you get started in science? How old were you when you started being interested and did you have any role models? I mean, so I, I can jump in. Uh, I, I think I found science um, somewhat later than some people did. So, so, so I know some people said, oh yeah, I knew, you know, I always wanted to be a scientist or something like that. And that was definitely not me. Um, I, all the way through elementary school and middle school, I never really liked science and I didn't even like science. Um, my freshman year in high school, my biology class, I really didn't like that either. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but then I, uh, I took a chemistry course and I liked that a little bit better. Um, but I also grew up in the Chicago area. And so um, where I lived happened to be sort of right between Argonne National Lab and Fermi Lab. And so both of those big national labs um, had outreach activities for high school students. And so I only went to those because my high school science teacher said, oh, if you go, you can get extra credit. And so I'm like, oh, okay, I'll go for the extra credit. Not because I was necessarily inherently interested in, in this. Um, but then when I actually um, heard these scientists talk about what they were doing, I really was interested. And I think part of it is I had no exposure. In my background, I have no folks in my family who are scientists, right? So I like didn't really know what science was beyond what I had seen in science classes. And I loved, um, you know, so the folks at Argonne Lab were physicists and chemists who were really thinking a lot about sort of 
technologies for energy efficiency, right? And they were thinking about, I also remember I'm old. And so this was before everyone had cell phones. And I remember they were talking about like developing these phones that could fit in your pocket. And I thought that was really cool. And so there was like all this technology that seemed like it could make a difference in sort of how our everyday lives, you know, worked and, and changed that. And then, um, at the, and then I also went to this Saturday morning science series at Fermilab, and there it was all these physicists and astronomers who were talking about things like what is the, you know, what is the nature of our universe? What is the history of our universe? What is the future of our universe? And I was just fascinated, I think, in particular, that physics was one discipline that could, so these people were all physicists that I was hearing about, and they were exploring questions from, like, really practical things that could change our everyday life, all the way up to, like, really abstract things, but that were sort of mind-blowingly interesting. And so that was actually, it was the juxtaposition of those two, getting to hear scientists at those two national labs talk that, that then really got me interested in, in actually um, thinking that physicists, physics was something I would want to study and, and I might want to do. Um, I can go next. Um, I think similar to Melissa, I also um, got into science and physics a little bit on the later side, um, but I think my story is a little bit different. So when I grew up, um, I was, uh, I did a lot of ballet dancing. And so, you know, when I was very young, it was very much, I was going to be a ballerina and my sister was sort of the scientist. Um, and I think it wasn't until um, high school that I really started getting into science and physics. Um, and I had a high school physics teacher who was just awesome. And um, really just made physics fun. And I think the big thing that happened was just sort of, you know, I started doing well on tests and homework and stuff like that. And it was sort of this feeling of, oh, I can actually do this or I could be good at it. And I think um, something in high school just sort of gave me a little bit of a confidence boost, um, which started getting me interested in science. Um, even then I went to college planning um, to be a biochemist. I sort of was still thinking maybe I would be go to medical school and become a doctor. Um, and then I think, uh, CSI was really popular on TV at the time. So I think I wanted to be a forensic scientist as sort of my backup plan. Um, and it turns out when I got to college, I really just didn't enjoy my biology or chemistry classes at all. <laughs> um, and I was sort of opting to do the optional physics and math homework instead, which was um, really uh, strange. But, um, but I still, I didn't really know what I could do with a physics degree. And so I sort of was hesitant to do that because I didn't see what the sort of career paths and stuff like that were. Um, so I talked to my first year my first semester um, physics professor and um, met with him after the semester had ended just to sort of ask like, what would it mean to be a physics major? And he gave me this really neat presentation talking about all of the different careers that physicists do and things that you can um, do with a physics degree. Um, and none of them were very exciting to me, actually. <laughs> I don't think any of them really appealed to me. But at the end of it, he said, you know, whatever you're gonna do, you're gonna do it for a really long time. So you should do what you love and the, the jobs and the careers will sort of fall in place um, if you're pursuing what you're passionate about. And that has certainly been true since. So um, yeah, it was a very windy path. Um, so I'm a little different. I actually don't remember a time in my life when I wasn't interested in science. Um, I feel like my very early preschool kindergarten teachers were really great at, um, at sort of calling different little projects and things we were doing science. And so I always associated really fun things with science and that continued throughout my elementary, middle, high school. I was very into science in high school. I took elective science classes. So I was just like very nerdy in that sense. Um, and I went to college assuming that I was going to major in some sort of uh, biology, probably um, some, like something within the natural sciences. But I did come late to engineering. I had, well, firstly, with science, I had several female teachers. I didn't have anybody in my immediate life that I knew who was in, worked in, who was like a professional scientist. But I did have, it was very normal for me to associate women with being in the scientific field. But I had to learn later on that that was like an issue that isn't normal necessarily. Um, but then, like I said, I actually came to engineering late. I had 
when I was in college, I had absolutely no idea what engineering meant. I didn't know anyone who was an engineer. I would like hear people talk about majoring in engineering and I like, didn't understand what it meant. So it took a long time for me to be like um, interacting with folks and sort of warming up to the concept of what engineering was. Um, and still it wasn't something that I thought I would ever get into, but then um, throughout my like early 20s and moving into my later 20s, um, I started seeing women like me becoming software engineers and that sort of solidified it in my brain that it was something that I could do um, just because I was seeing it for the first time and because I decided to take such a non-traditional path to engineering, it really, seeing people do it really opened that up to me. Those are great stories. Thank you for sharing. Kiara wants to know, do you think it's important to have role models in STEM or can you not have role models and still succeed? Um, I'll jump in just because I was sort of talking about this topic. I think that it's really important to have role models, um, especially because it takes a lot of, in my view, it takes a lot of resilience in order to get through a lot of the stressful and difficult obstacles that arise when you're engaging in something as difficult as um, pursuing a career in STEM. But I don't think that they necessarily need to be role models that you have in your immediate life. I think even learning about people who've come before you can be really important and influential just because um, it sort of opens up the possibilities that you have. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, I think one of the things that I would say is I think it's important to have a support system, right? And so um, what that support system looks like can be very different for different people and at different stages, it might be different. Um, and so at some point it might be that you feel um, like just having peers who are supportive of what your interests are and who, you know, sort of are cheerleaders when you're going through a tough time, right? And who sort of respect the decisions you've made and want to see you be successful in what in following through on your goals, that can be really valuable. Um, and then at other times, it is valuable to have someone who's maybe a little bit ahead of you, who knows the ropes, who can kind of um, help you ask good questions or sort of see what the landscape is that you might not be familiar with. And, and it might be someone who you consider a mentor, or it might just be someone who is, uh, you've connected with in, in another way and don't really know them very well, right? But they're willing to sort of answer your questions and, and things like that. And so, so I think finding people who will be supportive in different ways is really important. And I think at different type times of your career who you need and what you need looks very different and so I mean one of the things that I always tell people is just try to build a network of people who are invested in you know seeing you be successful in what your goals are right and and who those people are and what roles they play are different but but creating that network is really is really valuable yeah, I fully agree with what um, both Melissa and Stephanie said. And I don't think I have a ton to add to that, but I thought I would also add a, um, another perspective that sometimes having anti-role models, I have also found to be really helpful. People who like tell you no, and you just say, mm, I'm gonna prove them wrong. And sometimes those people have also, um, I think pushed me in my career. Um, my mom was actually one of them. My mom is very supportive. I should say this, 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 this is being recorded, right? Um, <laughs> my mom is very supportive, but when I told her I was switching into physics, she was confused and sort of had this question of why physics? What are you going to do with physics? Um, and so um, I think that so sometimes that negativity can actually kind of fuel you. Um, another example was actually someone who, when I started going into physics education research and was saying, I think I want to study lab courses, um, someone sort of said, ah, there's not a lot of research there. It's a pretty messy space to do research. I don't think you want to go there. And I sort of said, challenge accepted. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to pave that way. So I think sometimes having people who um, don't support you can also be kind of motivating, but definitely having that supportive network is very, very important. <laughs> and then we have a question for Stephanie. What's it like working for Google and what is the best advice you can give for people who want to code? 
Um, well, working for Google is very comfortable. That's the best way I could describe it. They are really interested in um, keeping their employees happy. So that means that they provide us with a lot of perks that I personally feel everybody should have access to in their workplace. But um, is there something that make it really easy to just focus on my job? Like whether it's having coffee shops inside our office, having lunch cooked for us, um, having gyms and being able to make your own schedule. Um, so it's really, really nice to have access to these things. And working at a company that's so large, you have access to research, to um, resources to keep learning. So that's one of the biggest things that I love. We have tons of classes that I can take. Um, so I'm always continuing to learn throughout my career, not just focusing on the one area I'm in. Um, and some advice that I would give would be to just start playing with code. So there are so many tutorials just on YouTube. Um, still, as a professional, when I want to learn something new, I will frequently go and, on YouTube and be like, okay, who wrote a tutorial explaining this before I even go and try to read the um, like traditional explanations and stuff because there are just so many people who are so great at breaking complicated concepts down. So I would say um, going online, finding resources, there are often things like Hour of Code, there's one really amazing um, program called Sonic Pi where you code music. So if you're interested in music, you can learn that and um, it as like a gateway into coding. Um, so I think that just, yeah, being creative and not being afraid to just go play with it because you don't need to have taken a class. You don't need to have somebody tell you, okay, you can go. So you, you really can just jump in and start whenever you want. That's great. And we'll probably add those to our science resource page later today. So for anyone interested, check that out and you can find the links there. Um, and we have a cool little, we've gone international. Hello from Canada. We are 10 and 13 years old and love science, robotics and space and do a lot of our own learning. Every child is a scientist and has interest in some subject. How do we ensure that adults do not treat us kids as well, just kids? Can kids be good teachers too? And they might know things that adults don't. How do we create spaces for that? Uh, I mean, I, I think you're definitely right in that kids can be experts on things, right? And, and um, you know, I know, you know, if you are really interested in something and have read a lot and explored a lot, um, you know, I think that idea of science is a community endeavor and then finding ways to share what you've learned, what you've explored with other people, you know, who are your age or even who are older, right? Sometimes there's older people who are intimidated by technology or intimidated by science. Science, and yet with your enthusiasm or you know what you've discovered you can actually sometimes reignite a curiosity that maybe older people have lost and and so I think definitely there is space for you know younger people to um, teach each other and become experts but also then use their enthusiasm for science to to sort of bring along people who have maybe lost their enthusiasm for science or who don't know how to use the technology. And, and so I would say, if that's something that you're interested in, I would definitely encourage you to, to find ways to share your enthusiasm and to teach other people. Yeah, exactly what Melissa said. And hello, Canada. I am originally from Canada as well. Um, I, I think on top of that, you know, I think remembering that science is about, it's about a process. It's not, you know, as much as we focus on the wonderful discoveries that scientists have made, it really is about how we get there. And I think anyone can engage in that process. Um, and so I think sometimes just reminding the adults that it's not about the answer, it's about the journey and figuring out, you know, how do we ask questions and how do we even solve these problems and answer these questions. Focus on that process rather than, than the results that you get at the end. And from Erin, what is the hardest thing you have had to overcome in your field? Um, well, I can share. So for me, the hardest thing has definitely been, uh, well, I definitely don't overcome my identity. I love my identity, but I have to overcome other people's um, assumptions about me because of my identity. So. Um, in engineering, there, uh, 
women are definitely underrepresented and then especially um, people of color are also underrepresented. So for me being a black woman, I'm often the only person um, who is a black woman or who's black at all anywhere on at an engineering event or on an engineering um, floor. And so come, overcoming the assumptions people have about me and also just overcoming the sort of isolation that can come with that and going um, out of my way to make sure that I make connections with people who share similar background and perspectives that I have and also just communicating with others in my environment to make sure that it stays safe and to make sure that people are um, acknowledging and recognizing my abilities regardless of what they think about maybe me being a woman or all of these things. So that is just the biggest obstacle on a daily basis. Um, I think to add to that, I think also sometimes um, we also face sort of our own self-doubt and, you know, there's something called imposter syndrome where you have the feeling that, you know, you're an imposter and you're not actually excellent at the thing that you're actually excellent at and you think that people are going to sort of find you out. Um, and so while there is certainly the sort of other people judging us, I think there's often sometimes just our own implicit um, judgment where we start doubting our own abilities um, and overcoming that I think is, is a real struggle and it's something every day you've got to have that inner monologue um, going and telling, reminding you that no, you're awesome and you're doing great stuff um, and, and you're not an imposter and everyone thinks that they're an imposter and it's totally normal um, and that's sort of a, a daily struggle I think to overcome that. Yeah, I agree with I agree with both uh, both Stephanie and Natasha. I think probably more on a daily basis, um, I deal with self doubt, right? And and I kept thinking like, oh, at one point I would like reach the point where I felt like I was established enough, right? But I'm a full professor of physics, and I still <laughs> like doubt myself. So, so the fact that you'll ever get over it, if you may never, right? And and so that's, uh, I think that's something to keep in mind. But I, I think part of the reason why there is this self doubt is sometimes. Um, you know, the fact that you're looking around and there aren't necessarily a lot of other women or a lot of other people who look like you that then makes you wonder about, you know, how you fit in and that can feed that self-doubt, so. Yeah, I know imposter syndrome is definitely something we all suffer from. Um, Zahara wants to know, when you were in college, did you major in different subjects than you're currently working in now? And I think that kind of ties into some other great questions. Um, were you influenced by any other non-STEM courses when you were in school? And do you draw from them now in your current fields? Um, so I will go, I majored in physics and I'm still in physics, but in college I also minored in history um, because I was really, it was one of those things where I just, I was always interested in history and I also really like to write and I like to sort of dig into like carefully reading documents and reading behind the lines and so that idea of um, sort of exploration. I like exploring history as much as I like exploring um, physics. And, and so I, I would say that I probably don't use history, um, you know, in the day to day, but I, I do think the idea of the importance of communication and how we communicate with people um, is, is really important. And I think the other thing that I'm constantly aware of because of my background in history is that science is not something that is sort of absolute and stands outside a culture. Um, it is embedded in culture and there's a whole bunch of um, factors about the people who are doing science and the world circumstances in which they are doing science that impacts how science gets done, who feels comfortable in science, um, who doesn't feel comfortable in science. And so I think much of that uh, understanding and appreciation comes from the fact that I, uh, from my studies of history, so. Um, well, I definitely did not study engineering or computer science. I studied sociology and political economy when I was in college. Um, I think that it absolutely informs my work every day. Um, similar to Melissa, uh, my background helps me to think about the context in which I'm developing technologies and who is going to use them, how they're going to use them. 
um, and who is actually creating those technologies. So it's something that's always on my mind, particularly because I'm really interested in engaging um, technical literacy within underrepresented populations. So all of the things that I learned about um, communities and um, economic structures really influences um, where I go with my work. Um, also with sociology and political economy, there are, there's a need for thinking in systems, um, whether it's human systems or economic systems. And that gave me a lot of practice for thinking about systems in my work now as an engineer. Um, so I think I already mentioned I started out in college as a biochemistry major and then made the switch over to physics a little bit later on. Um, and I think uh, a lot of my friends uh, who were also physics majors wanted to pick up like minors in things like math or computer science uh, or even double majors and stuff like that. Um, and I think I sort of made the choice not to do that and just to focus on physics because that sort of freed up my schedule to take some different stuff. So I got to take philosophy courses, I took choir for credit um, and kept up with my dance and got into extracurriculars and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that having that sort of very broad um, set of experiences, diverse set of experiences, um, really sort of helped make me, I don't know, it got allowed, you know, influenced me in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think that that ended up being really beneficial. We often talk about how, you know, diverse perspectives in science are so valuable. And so the more you can actually give your own sort of diverse perspectives and, and you know, if you want to do a minor in something that's a little bit non-traditional, like history or something like that, you know, I think that um, will make you a, a more well-rounded scientist and, and, yeah, can only help. I think that's great advice. I will also apologize for my cat. He's very excited to be uh, listening in on this panel. His name is Shmoo for anyone wondering. Um, but uh, so Jacqueline would like to know who your favorite female historic scientist is, uh, if you have. I don't, favorite female historic scientist. I guess it could be not historic. Hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, I mean, so I will say there are some people who were very senior scientists who I had the chance of meeting like, you know, once or twice, once they were, you know, near the end of their careers who I really appreciated. So Millie Dresselhouse was a condensed matter physicist at MIT who just had a really interesting, a very full career as a physicist. She also had a family and just was an amazing woman who had a great sense of humor and just had a wonderful perspective on life that I really loved and appreciated. Um, and so I only had the chance to interact with her once or twice, but I, uh, I really appreciated that. And, and just the, the perspective of, you know, she started her career in a totally different era and had to face many more challenges than what I faced. So she's someone who I definitely hold in high esteem and really appreciate what she, what she did. So I'm terrible with names. So I'm sure there are a million that I can't think of, like there are people in my mind, but I'm like, I can't think of things. But um, one woman who's really been influential for me was Ada Lovelace. So she was um, a mathematician in the 19th century who was uh, really influential in developing like computational machines and paving the pathway. Um, and actually the engineering program I went to was named after her. So she has like a special place in my heart and I think about her in my career. Um, I, uh... Like all of these ideas, and again, my brain is also like spinning with all of the people. Like, who should I talk about? Um, and I, I think um, part of my sort of switch into physics in college, you know, really was because of some of the, the role models that were around me at the time. And so I, I think I want to. Um, uh, Joanna Miro was one of my um, professors when I was in college, and uh, I think she was particularly influential on me as uh, one of the first female professors that I had. And so um, just again, this example of this awesome 
kick butt woman who could do cool physics um, and was an amazing teacher and really friendly and personable and just sort of showed me a very different um, perspective of what a scientist was. So I'm going to go non-historical for this one. Yeah, there was an uh, amendum to it of someone who inspires you. And I think those are all inspiring women. Um, and we have about 10 minutes left and we got a great, I think, final question. And it's, I would love to hear your thoughts on the role of learning in a formal environment, like in school versus self-learning. I mean, I, I guess I would jump in and I think I would say that there are, for different people, the balance of what they need is really different. Um, and so for some people um, who are really just uh, self-driven and, and curious, right, that, that learning outside of school can, can be great. And particularly because depending upon what your school environment is like and what your teachers are like, sometimes there are teachers and environments that just aren't nurturing of particular interests or particular approaches. And so if that's the kind of environment you find yourself in school, right, then I think definitely the opportunity to just follow your own interests outside is, is the way to go, right? But, um, but at the same time, right, I also know that there are some kind context where, you know, having the opportunity to sort of share in a community with other people and be, you know, have someone who can, you know, when you get stuck, who can help you give you a little nudge or, you know, ask a particularly well-timed question that helps you figure out why you're stuck um, can be, can be really helpful. And, and, you know, if you have great teachers and in a great environment, then school can be really valuable in that way. And so, I think it, it depends upon the environments that you're in. And I think both have a, have a really important role, can have a really important role and um, different environments can work better for different people or for different questions or areas that they wanna be interested in exploring. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Melissa that it definitely is a little bit of both, I think, and they offer very different things. Um, you know, Melissa described the person, if you're very self-driven, then maybe working, you know, self-learning is totally fine. I would consider myself a relatively driven kind of person, um, but I also remember afternoons where I would be trying to do my, you know, p &M homework in my, um, in my dorm room and just getting stuck and getting so frustrated. And so, you know, no amount of drive could get me out of that sort of stuck. And, and then that's where I, you know, turned to friends and we all bounded together or we'd go and talk to them go to office hours and try to get answers and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I think that there's, um, there's, it's definitely a mix. You've, you've got to um, pursue the stuff that you're interested in, I think, on your own, but then also um, the classroom is, is a really fun place to, to, that I think can push you a little bit farther than um, you would necessarily push yourself. And I think that's one of the benefits of sort of the formal learning environment. Yeah, I absolutely agree with Natasha and Melissa about this balance. Um, I'm somebody who has always really loved structure, so I absolutely loved learning in a formal environment, but there were, there were times when that environment really was not um, nurturing for me and made me feel excluded. Actually, the very first time that I was introduced to programming when I was in middle school, it was an environment that was really um, just non-supportive. And I moved away. I didn't want to take any more programming classes. But outside of school, I was exploring computers on my own and working on coding and doing all these things. And so it set the foundation for me to return to that um, field later in life. Um, and I also feel that outside of school, you can sometimes have a little bit more um, collaboration. Um, Natasha was saying you can work with your friends, you can sort of go in different directions that you want. So I think that that is one benefit to not just keeping your learning within the structures of school, but engaging outside. Well, great. And um, I just want to end this with, do you guys have any last minute advice for the attendees? Um, maybe something that wasn't addressed in previous questions. I, 
I guess I would just say that I, I really appreciated all the questions that people asked and I would just encourage people to keep asking questions of people who they uh, who they find who share their interests or who have followed paths that they think are creative. So I think uh, I think questions are a great way to to move forward and figure out what opportunities are for you. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think one of the things that often um, doesn't get talked about enough is just how creative science actually is. And, you know, I think sometimes we think if you're interested in art or performance or other sorts of things, then um, science isn't for you. But I actually think that there really is a place for all of those skills and interests in science and, um, you know, being creative and thinking outside the box and, and being artistic, all of those skills are actually really in, important in science. And so um, I think you can you can bring those into science. It's not just about doing math and getting right answers and stuff. Yeah, I would add that, um, well, to keep um, asking questions like Melissa said, but to also um, be proactive in reaching out to other mentors and other um, people who can influence you on your path as you're trying to decide where you want to go within STEM. Um, in my experience, people who people are people tend to be a lot more receptive than you would expect. There have been times when I've reached out to people that I admired just out of the blue and never thought that they would never answer, but they actually respond and give me feedback that I'm looking for. So I would definitely recommend um, not limiting yourself and going out and finding more people that you can learn from at every step. Well, this was really fun and I, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Uh, I really appreciate your insights uh, into the STEM fields. It's good to know for me as well as the audience. Um, and I wanted to thank you guys for taking the time to do this. And, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day before I pass this off to Barit uh, and enjoys the rest of the webinar. So Barit, back to you. Thanks, Jenna, and thank you again to all of our panelists. Um, it was so wonderful to have you.